this computer decided to update when I plugged it in. So it's at 100% and now it's just going through the, uh, so uh, it'll make it a little easier. I can pull up all the images. So this is going to be a little different uh, in that I'm going to tell the story of the hotel through the people who lived in it. So, you know, there'll be excerpts from uh, Mrs. Welty's diary. There'll be stories that have been published in newspapers and magazines over the years. And I'm just going to cover the period that the Welties had it, so from approximately 1885 to 1925. But there's a, there's a lot of fun stories. I think you guys will enjoy it. Now the glasses. Where's the glasses? That's the next thing. On the table behind you. There it is. And these, these I got a piece of wire holding one side. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's been there a long time. I don't know if it is 100%. I mean, I, I couldn't tell you the date that it was put in, but it is, we haven't touched anything, and I don't think anything, I mean, the only thing we did, we, we put in uh, heat and air with mini splits, and we were very careful that whatever we did, we didn't damage anything that was that was already there, so... That was our goal, was to make sure we could keep everything uh, as original as we could. Okay, so I'm going to start with the uh, the first excerpt I'm going to have is from uh, Mary Jane's Wealthy's Pioneer, the book that was written about her uh, her whole life. And so what we're going to do, we're going to start in uh, chapter 17 of that book. And what happens is, uh, well, let's do it in her words. When, uh, when Mary was fully recovered, uh, RJ or, or John began to talk of making a change. Mary was tired of going from place to place, weary of forever moving on. She had hoped to live all the rest of her days in Happy Valley, which was somewhere between Temecula and Pala. When John came home one night, and announced to the family at supper that he had bought a lot of Temecula and thought he should build a house and move there, Mary was glad. Every one of the seven girls remaining welcomed the prospect of change. John's brother Joe was there also. He and, uh, do you know what we can do at Temecula, Joe, said John? We will build a hotel. Many are coming and going, cattlemen, trainmen, government agent with his Indians, the one hotel is always crowded. Temecula can easily support another. We'll put up the building. Mary can boss and the girls do the work. <laughs> how, does that, how does that sound to you ladies? All right, Papa said uh, uh, Hattie and Tilly both. John Welty's foresight was good. The venture was a success. Conductors, brakemen, salesmen, ranchers all found a congenial home atmosphere and good meal. In the lobby, the guests discussed crops, cattle, and politics. Often, the Indian agent arrived with 40 or 50 Native children under his care on the way to the government school in Warner Ranch.
just the air. Yeah, it, it was there originally before they before they built the uh, Sherman Indian School, and then that was in Paris before it was in Riverside. They actually had about I think 240 acres in, in Paris. In so is it right like where the ranch building is now, the Warner you know, Warner Museum there? Or? That I couldn't tell you. That's Yeah, yeah, we've been to that museum. Interesting. The computer is just acting on its own. Okay, so what this is, this is a blow, blow up of the, uh, the, the lots right down where the hotel is located. So you've got, you've got Main Street and then the uh, lots that uh, uh, the Welties bought is he bought the two closest to the creek, so lots 22 and 21. My wife and I spent days researching deeds down in San Diego County at the recorder's office. Never could find a deed. Well, <clears throat> we found in 1994, or I'm sorry, 1894, we found three deeds that were recorded in Riverside County. And what they addressed is, Welty said, when the hotel burned down in 1891, the deeds were in there, so he lost all the deeds. Oh. So the two lots, there were two different people he bought, bought the lots from. So one individual is deceased. So they had to go through the probate court in San Francisco where the person passed away, and then they were able to get a court order there. And then the other person lived back east, and they went through his attorney there. It took him about a year to finally get that straightened out and, and actually get the deeds. But that's why... If you search, you'll never find the original deeds. So he bought one, one lot from one person, one lot from the other person. So where the hotel sits right now, it would be from the creek, it'd be the first 50 feet was what the original purchase was by, by Welty. How much was the lot? Uh, you know, I don't have... <laughs> the, the copies I get from Riverside County are so poor. They were, uh, they were actually images that they microfilmed. Micro I have no idea if the county still has original records. Uh, mm -hmm. If they did, for what they charged me for, I researched them, found them, and all they did is just printed out what I gave them. It cost me 100 bucks for like <laughs> 10 pages. And, you know, they could have given me nice clean images from, from the original because, you know, when it's black and white and it's faded, it, it, it's really hard to tell. But... That was, you know, because we want to put the hotel in the National Register of Historic Places, so we're really working diligently on finding out all the stories, all the facts, everything about the hotel, so we can be as accurate as possible. And uh, we were just, we were happy enough to, to track it down, because Chris and I had talked about it. He said, well, you know, when that hotel burned, you know, he probably just had them sitting in the drawer, you know, you got you to take a buggy ride down to downtown San Diego, Go pay a filing fee. I just hang on to these things. Let me just put them in the drawer, you know. I'm not going to worry about it. So, uh, so anyway, that's, that's, the, uh, that's the lots, uh, 22 and 21. And then we found out that uh, Pullman, <coughs> which will come into play later, is the, uh, he had the, uh, he bought the next lot next to them. So, the next document is a, it's a directory that was published in 1886, and we have, um, uh, okay, so on here, I don't know if you can see it, but you got R.J. Welty with the, uh, with the hotel. So we know in this directory, published in 1886, so odds are he probably had started the hotel before that to uh, make sure he got into the directory. The next part, this was this was a article published in the Los Angeles Times on August 29, 1887. And the part I'm going to start with is 
they uh, they kind of really put down Temecula. Uh, out through the indescribable loveliness of the San Gabriel Valley along the foothold, foothold hill range and, and into the hot but awakening San Bernardino and out, out again past the green Eden of Riverside and down into the more uncivilized regions that lie between the southern hills the train rails on. There's a stop at the thriving little town of Murrieta for one of the best meals to be found at any railroad eating house in the country. And a few minutes later, the train slows up beside the demoralized boxcar, which does duty as a station at Temecula. Here I debarked, and so did other tourists, some able gentlemen uh, who were going to attend the fiesta at Pala also. They were, they were not sentimentalists bound to study the problem of Indian rights in, in its lair, nor yet wanderers from the elite east in pursuit of an elusive lung. They were merely going over to Pallas to civilize the native. They were not going over to Pallas to civilize the natives. Temecula is rather more interesting as a memory than as a fact. It's one short street boasts less than a dozen houses, all of them ungorgeous gray. It is notable, however, as the scene of the eviction which is so graphically described in Ramona. Mr. Welty, the proprietor of the Deepa Hotel, carries the mail three times a week between Temecula and Pala, and half an hour upon my arrival I was comfortably bestowed to his buckboard uh, rattling over the broad plain which stretches southwest. So it just description of Temecula in 1887 in the L.A. Times. I don't think they probably would be any nicer today. Do uh, <laughs> actually, I really agree. Article in the Travis section about Temecula about a month ago. Oh, did you? <laughs> Okay, this, this excerpt is out of a, uh, uh, a book on the history of California that was published in the 1890s. And I want to concentrate on one short area here. Mr. Machado purchased the stock and carried on business under the name of Machado & Company until 1889. When the store and the contents were utterly destroyed, entailing a loss of $12,000 to the son alone. Undaunted by this disaster, however, he removed to the Welty Hotel building and once more opened up for business with a complete assortment of goods. Two years later, in 1891, he was again visited by the fire fiend, and as before, the stock was completely ruined. This was surely a severe test for one possession, even the courageous spirit, but he proved equal to it and phoenix-like rose from the ashes and reestablished himself once more in business. The struggle was long and strenuous, but in 10 years he had cleared off all of his old debts and was on the high road to success, which it is today. Um, so now, you know Machado, he had, where 1909 is, is where he had a wooden store building. And that's the one that it, it burned down in the fire in 1887. And, uh, uh, like he just lost everything, and so he actually relocated to the hotel. Is, is that the same Machado? Uh, there's an adobe up at the uh, up in the hills there. Mm -hmm. Well, this is Mac Machado, and then he had his father. Uh, and there's a Machado in Elsinore too. Yeah, yeah. his father and grandfather. Oh, yeah, okay. father. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> going to see more of the fire later here. Um, the U.S. Post Office was in the hotel starting in 1887. Uh, the, uh, it was in the hotel for eight years. Then in 1895, the post office was moved to the wealthy home, which is behind the hotel, where it was for the next 20 years.
we also uh, know with the schools that in uh, 1888, they formed the uh, uh, Pujol School District because you already had a little Temecula school district. So uh, they, they had to have an election for a bond to build a schoolhouse. The first bond failed, so school was then in the hotel. And then they, the second bond passed, and that's when they built the, the schoolhouse, which is now over on Santiago. When the uh, teachers were there at the school, they would get a nine-month contract for uh, the school district to pay room and board at the hotel. So they get their meals in there, and that's where they stayed. So didn't have to go far to work. And there's the schoolhouse that's now over on uh, Santiago as a church now. Okay. Fire in Temecula. That was the, the uh, it was in the San Diego Union, January 6, 1891. They announced that on uh, the general merchandising store of Machado and Company and the saloon and hotel of R.J. Wel Welty at Temecula were burned on the night of January 2nd. The loss is $3,500. No insurance. The cause is unknown. Now, when the uh, Ray's Cafe and the house adjoining it were, were cleaned out in Murrieta, the uh, Murrieta Historical Society worked with the owner of the property. They, they hauled all the stuff away, but they were able to keep certain things. And one of the things they found is a little tiny diary that fit in the palm of your hand. And it belonged to Hutchinson of the Hutchinson Dairy. Hutchinson Dairy, uh, they used to sell their butter. Their butter was known throughout this area as the best butter around. They, they sold it to uh, the hotel. And so in this diary, he says, The wealthy house caught fire at 4 p.m. and burned all they had and Pullman's. So that's all, all, all it says. So for a long time, Horace Parker had, had speculated that when they're talking about Pullman's, that it was in the hotel. He thought it was in the Hotel Temecula, but you already had Machado's in the hotel. There's no way you're going to have two, two general stores there. So that's when we were doing this research. We finally found out that the third lot over that the hotel now is, is over, that was owned by Pullman. He had a little wooden store. There were some newspaper stories prior to the fire where he's having trouble with a couple of young, youngsters working in there. And uh, there's speculation that they may have uh, started the fire. But nevertheless, it was, uh, it was a freestanding building. And whether it started there or, or in the hotel, Nobody's really been able to take and, and figure that out. I do have uh, Horace Parker's notes. We had gone to, uh, uh, we, we've gone through all, all, all the papers that he had donated uh, to look at his take on this. So he starts out in old diaries kept by Hutchinson of Temecula. <coughs> Describes the following entry, the wealthy house caught fire, 4 p.m., burnt all they have, and pulled in the store. Hutchinson, so he says that he must be talking about the wealthy house. And uh, so I say it was, that one just kept bothering me, so it was nice to finally track down what, what the real story was there. Now we also have another much more detailed account of the fire from Mrs. Welty. She writes in her diary, January 3rd, 1892, Tilly and Hattie were ironing in the summer kitchen. And I don't know if you know what the summer kitchen was at the hotel. They used to have a water tank on the building. It was up on the second floor. And then the area below there, because the tanks would always leak, it would cool that area, and they would, they would use it as their summer kitchen. The auto house over on Pujol, uh, 
I talked to the individual who bought the property, and we're working with them to try and, and save the, the, the buildings. And I went into the water tank building, and on the ground floor is a kitchen. It's, a, it's the summer kitchen that people had always had here. So it's nice to see an intact one, see exactly, it's never been touched. So um, Anyway, so she goes on to say, um, suddenly the station agent, Mr. Duncan, burst open the front door with a cry of fire. Mr. Gonzalez, had, had, that's the Gonzalez with the Gonzalez Adobe up on Jefferson. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez had boarded a train for San Bernardino, but seeing the hotel on fire, had jumped from the moving train to give the alarm. Mr. Duncan, however, had beat him in the race for the burning building. Everyone rushed out to find a crowd gathered and flames shooting from the roof. Franny hurried to the backyard and, and let out the hens. She drove the cow and horses from the stables and kept them all away from the fire. A woman boarder came running from a neighbor's house. My baby, she cried. He, he's asleep upstairs. Terry McConville, another boarder, made a dash for the stairs. Hey, Terry, get my Sunday suit, shouted a friend. <laughs> Not on your life, said Terry. When he, when he reached the head of the stairs and the flames were licking their way through the door, Mary found the baby in the dining room. The mother had forgotten where she had left the child. A high wind was fanning the flames. Nothing was saved but the organ and the kitchen clock. The guests lost everything they had, and they went to Pete Moran's hotel on the other corner. The, the family found shelter in a small cottage just back of the hotel site. That's the little house that's behind the hotel. Um, good neighbors sent, sent in enough to make them comfortable. In the morning, Mary and John were looking over the ruins of their home and business, trying to decide what to do. When one of the boys, who had been with them since the hotel first opened its doors to the public, came over. Now, think about that for a minute. How many daughters did Miss Bolte have? Uh, seven survived? And boys were hanging around there? Huh? I don't know. Good morning, Mr. Welty. What chance for breakfast, called one. Pretty slim picking this morning, laughed the landlady. We're going to eat here, said another. You can't get rid of us by burning up the building. <laughs> Away they went to return with a supply of provisions, tin cups, and pie tins. The boys improvised the table under the scorched and blackened trees while John built a campfire and Mary prepared breakfast. The loyalty and cooperation of these young men, as well as their weekly checks, gave the wealthy's courage to carry on. John was happy. He would not say that he was happier because of the fire, but John loved to start things, and here was something to do. Here was the change he had longed for, a break in the monotony of living. He immediately began to rebuild. When the new structure was finished and furnished, nearly all of their guests returned to feel that they were home again. Does it how long it took for that rebuild? No, it doesn't. And so that's, that's the rebuilt hotel. Uh, we don't have any pictures of the original hotel, but okay here. <clears throat> so this is an illustration you guys have seen before, and apparently the uh, Parkers got hold of this. Horse Parker would advertise that he would pay money for any kind of anything on Murrieta, Temecula, and anywhere else. And the interesting thing about this is the, uh, you look up here, it says the wealthy house and the Pullman store. So it does identify, again, that the wealthy home, hotel and the Pullman store are separate structures. They're not, you know, and when you look, it's just a line drawing, and as much as I can enlarge it, the original hotel did not look very big. It was pretty small, so. Uh, yeah, so, you know, what's interesting is all the granite 
that goes around in front there, all of that is still there. The wooden deck is built out over it. So it's all there. If you actually just get down and look under there, you can see it all. Yes? The store that would have been there is over on the left right. doorway? That's Correct. Okay. Which, now, this is the hotel after it was rebuilt, so you don't have the addition on the north side of it yet. Right. So uh, you have the post office was there, and then the groceries, and then that was also, uh, uh, they ended up incorporating the uh, dining in there for, uh, for the train when people come through. And if you notice, there's a, a door that leads right out the building there. Well, when they did the restaurant, Mrs. Wealthy had a problem. People would uh, eat really slowly, and they hear the train whistle, and they'd go running out that door and get on that train and take off and not pay their bill. We, for, for a new tenant that we have in the dining room now, we ended up, we refinished the floor. It's never, never been refinished before. And I had an, a, an individual do it who has done old houses in the 1880s and 90s in Redlands. And it was really neat to actually see the floor because we, we had taken the carpet up that had been on it for years and years and years. All of the floorboards, it's all duck fur, clear duck fur, but all the boards are 16 feet long. There are no, sh no short little pieces of wood in there. These are all, because it's all first growth, duck fur, nice, nice trees. And uh, the funny thing is that when the guy's doing the floor, he says, he says, it's really funny. He says at the, at the back of the room, what would be on the back wall, he says there's all these marks in there. He says it came from a woman's high heels in, in the 1890s. The, you know, a little metal piece on it. And he says it just looks like they were standing there the whole time doing this. I said that would have been Mrs. Wealthy keeping an eye on things, making sure nobody was going to dine and dash. But he, he found that when he was working on the floor. All these little marks right in that back there. Where he said it just looks like somebody was standing there keeping an eye on everybody. <laughs> Yeah, that's what she was doing. You gotta remember Mrs. Walkie was only like four foot eight or seven. So she, she was tiny. She was tiny. And birthed all those girls, eleven. Bonnie, how tall are you? I'm saying that's why So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to now give you just a little bit more of that uh, Horace Parker in his notes describing as he was restoring the hotel what he found uh, of the structure itself. The old quarrymen made many interesting granite pieces such as finely finished kitchen post, fence post, all types of pig and chicken troughs, fish ponds, clod busters, and the, the like, all made with granite. One of the things the wealthy girls remembered about the hotel was a finished slab of granite in which some wash basin had been cut out. This was a mystery until we began shoring up the hotel and found them broken and incorporated into the foundation, which would indicate they were used in the hotel which burned down. The hotel's foundation is made largely of granite curbing and the old wine cellar is constructed with discarded granite blocks. This old building, which has stood through numerous earthquakes and floods, is strangely constructed by modern standards. The lower story was built without a floor and only walls. Then they, they scabbed in to the plate where the floor joists were going to be. This eventually, what became the, the first floor is within the front wall, the, within the walls, because the, during the years, the nail 2x6 had pulled loose and the floor was starting to lose its support. We had been unable to lift the walls with jacks, although we can, we can move the lower floor to nearly uh, to uh, position it correctly again. The old foundation was still solid and a careful inspection showed a complete absence of termites and wood rot. This may be accomplished in one of three ways. The climate in Temecula may be too dry, and its extremes too, too great for termites and fun, fungi, 
The lumber was of top grade, live trees, and sound in all respects. The termites may find enough native wood along the river to keep them busy. Um, all of the wood used in it was redwood and cedar, and those are naturally deter termites. The window frames and door frames, those are dug fir, which they will get termites. So when we bought the property, we tented every single building and the little travel trailer because there were termites in the frames. But the, the rest of that building, it is solid. It's, it's just not going anywhere. All of the old building was nailed with square nails. When they came to the interior walls, there was little attention paid to the finish. Uh, and many of the rooms were, were finished in exterior siding of all dimensions. I have to picture the quarry just because you had not only the, the you had quarrymen who stayed in the hotel, and uh, the other thing is, as this picture shows you, you can see the, the hotel in the upper right corner, but this is taken on the other side of the creek, train tracks, and then you have Pujol Street, and you can see the, uh, you can see the, the uh, cranes they used to, to move the granite blocks. The, the quarrymen, a three-man crew, could take and cut enough granite to fill a flatbed rail car once a week, working all by hand, all hand tools, everything they did. So, pretty amazing. Here's more of Horace's notes. The original hotel was supplied with water from a windmill and a tank with a summer kitchen beneath. Sanitary facilities were taken care of by the typical outhouse with chamber pots and slop jars furnished the guests to aid uh, in old commodes, complete with pitchers and basins. Who emptied the pots is one of the mysteries. <laughs> the beds were ironed with straw mattresses. Many of the old furniture machines were still in the hotel when purchased by the Parkers in 1960. Old bureaus, commo commodes with unknown layers of paint were found in each room. Some of these had been stripped down to the wood and turned out to be beautiful. And when we were ready to open the hotel, we were short basins and pitchers. So Chris put out the word to some of the antique stores, and then they told her to come over to one store, and she's, she's there, and all these women are standing there with pictures and bowls to, <laughs> to help to her out. <laughs> of course, this picture is familiar. You got it up there. The, uh, the snowman on the front porch of the hotel. Was that? Do you know? uh, it was, because I ended up, I got my copy from the San Diego Historical Society. They may be paid full price for it, but, uh, <laughs> but it, had, it had all the details. I, I don't have a... Well, this see. used to be San Diego, so we started 18, in Riverside to do yeah. our research. 1897. And ended up in San Diego. Well, yeah, it happens every hundred years. Yeah, 1897. That's a, uh, that's still a nice view of, of looking at Old Town. you still got the livery stable, you've got the hotel, the train station. So, the next story, with the noise and confusion found in such a frontier, frontier hotel, Mr. and Mrs. Welty constructed a small house behind the hotel. 
which now serves as a shop and is known as, this is in the 1960s, the doghouse. Joe Welty, Joe, John Junger Brothers, served as Justice of the Peace for a time. The story is told how court was held in the, in the feed room of a barn in the rear of the hotel. The feed room faced the open manger. One hot summer day, a lawyer from San Diego was pleading a case in front of Judge Welty and a Temecula jury. The flies were bad, the heat was oppressive, the droning voice of the lawyer was monotonous, and the board jury was about asleep. The entire court was startled when the head had just laid a, uh, an egg. She'd been trying for some time. In the major, jumped up on the edge and began her shrill cackle. One disturbed by her persistent crack cackling was a juryman who whipped out his revolver and shot the hen. <laughs> Looking at the city lawyer, he said, This is what we do to long-winded bastards in Temecula. <laughs> <laughs> A now thoroughly frightened lawyer closed his arguments abruptly. <laughs> You can see uh, Joseph Welty, Temecula, uh, and this, this is for Justice of the Peace. So, um, we had those in California until they rewrote the Constitution in 19, 1947. Justice of the Peace didn't have to be an attorney. But you realize, every little town, if you had problems, you had to have law. You had to have somebody to come in and settle cases. So, uh, they used to use non-professionals. How's the time going? Everybody still good? Yeah. Okay, nobody's going to leave earlier. Now, right? <laughs> Can you zoom in to some of those other pictures when you do it too? I didn't realize yeah, you, you could zoom in. Oh, okay. Yeah. okay. That's wonderful. Yeah. So, this next is a story that was published in a magazine called The Capital. It was published in Los Angeles, California, January 8, 1898. So, the town of Temecula was the name of the story. And boy, it is really small. I can't. Well, here, if I enlarge it here. Yes, yes. Let's see. Let's try this. So I can read it. Okay. Out at the terminus of one of those Jim Crow branch roads on which the Santa Fe people lavished the money of its New England servant girls school stockholders is situated in the village of Temecula. There's not a great deal of Temecula, but what there is can be counted on. Like all places of its size, it has one big man, and his name is Joe Welty. Joe is 54. He looks about 30. He attributes his general good health and youthful appearance to the fact that he's always stuck to one brand of whiskey. <laughs> I agree with him. <laughs> he's, he's justice of the peace, runs a harness shop, clerks in his brother's store, helps out at his sister's hotel, lends a hand at the blacksmith shop, drives tourists out to the Pechanga Reservation, runs Pete Moran's saloon when that gentleman is otherwise engaged, and in fact does the business of the town. If Joe ever leaves, Temecula, we never want to visit it again. <laughs> Last time we were there, Joe had on a big overcoat and a baseball mask and said he was going to escort two ladies out to Paola who wanted to do some scratching. They were a couple of lady artists from Pasadena who were out sketching, but Joe didn't intend to take any chances. They asked Joe if he could take them to see an old ruin and he answered with all clarity that he could. The party drove out to Paula, and Joe pointed out Bill Veal, 
who was sitting on a fence and said, that's the oldest ruin in this region. Get out your paintbrushes. There's a law in Riverside County that you can't have cards and billiard tables in the same building with a saloon. The passage of this law caught Pete Moran with a bar and two billiard tables and only one room. He rented a house across the street for the billiard tables. But he found some difficulty when Joe Welty was out of town in running the two places. So he built a sort of watchtower in the middle of the street. And when he'd say the middle of the street, they're talking about the middle of Front and Main Street. Out in the middle. Uh, from his vantage point, he can command a view of both places. He hasn't lost a nickel since, and he put up, since he put up this watchtower. But to a stranger, it looks somewhat queer to see Pete perched up there, looking first to the left and then to the right. <laughs> Temecula has a large store kept by Philip Pullman. This gentleman wears a sweater and knee breeches, full bicycle costume. He was asked what make the wheel he rode. He says, I don't ride any wheel. This is a rational dress for business. Then it is economical. I haven't had any washing done since I commenced wearing it. <laughs> Pullman wears knee pants, but no stockings. He has his legs painted black from the knees down. He says that is also economical. <laughs> Colonel R.J. Welty Joe's brother also keeps a story, and it's a doozy. One day, one rule is that a thing once taken off the shelf or from a box must not be replaced. If it's not sold, it remains on the counter or the floor. The consequence is that things have a somewhat confused appearance in Colonel, Wel Colonel Welty's emporium of fashion. He buys and sells for cash alone with the result that when a, a man has a dollar, he spends it with Welty, and when he is broke, he trades with Pullman. <laughs> Under existing circumstances around Temecula, Pullman does the bulk of the business. <laughs> Colonel Welty did a thing lately that in these sordid days sounds very refreshing. He bought two carloads of flour just before the big rise in wheat. When his flour reached, reached in the market price of two twenty-five per barrel, more than he bought it, more than he bought it. To most businessmen, this would have seemed a stroke of fortune. Colonel Welty, however, added five percent onto this cost of his flour and sold it at that price. He declined to take advantage of the Temeculans and thereby earn their everlasting gratitude. In fact, so grateful were they that when Colonel Welty brought, bought a lot of sugar and it went down, the whole population of the valley arose as one man and demanded that he sell them sugar at the reduced price. <laughs> Since then, Welty has forsaken the passive philanthropy. <laughs> a lot of TV late at night, so what I do is I hunt through old newspapers and I look for stories on there, you know. And that's out of where? That was out of, out of a magazine called The Capital, published in L.A. Okay, Careless Boy with Cigarette. This was in the Evening Bee in Sacramento, California, September 1st, 1898. The Explosion. <laughs> Well, then I won't have to read it if I blow it up too much. <laughs> you need the, you, you know, then I'm out of job. <laughs> the explosion of a large quantity of gunpowder at a hotel in Temecula, this, this county, Tuesday evening, came near ending the lives of four children. Three children of D.H. Warren and one of John W. Carr were playing in a room in the hotel. A large quantity of powder was lying in a corner of the room in a sack. And it seems that the younger Charles Warren, who was smoking a cigarette, threw the lighted stub into the powder accidentally when the explosion occurred, immediately which wrecked the room and dangerously burned all of the children. A physician was at once summoned who relieved the sufferers of, much, of, of as much as they could. There is a doubt of their ultimate recovery as the powder birds are deep and in vital places. A large box of dynamite percussion caps was lying on the floor near 
the powder when the, when the uh, explosion occurred, but this did not explode. Had they done so, the four children would have been blown to atoms. The box in which the caps was kept was badly burned by the powder and uh, was on fire when the uh, neighbors came to the rescue of the children. A lot of weird things going on, Temecula. Richard, speaking of children, tell them the story about the kids swimming during oh. school. So, <laughs> back in the day, you know, Temecula gets hot. So, when, when it was a warm day out and they had their lunch break, the boys, they would head down to the creek. And as they go down to the creek, they start peeling their clothes off. Which creek? Murrieta Creek, and right, right, right by the hotel, because you had the school and then it was uh, on Fourth Fourth Street, right? It's not the school that's on Santiago now. I think it was on Fourth Street. Anyway, the uh, so the, kid, the the boys would start peeling their clothes off, get down to the creek, swim, and then when the school bell rang, they'd get dressed and come back. So there was a new teacher who didn't like what the boys were doing. She told them they had to knock it off. So, and I can't remember which, which boy it was, but his father would make wine. So the boys, east of the school, as you go toward the hillside, they dug a, they dug a cave into the hillside. And they went at lunch with a bottle of wine. Well, half the kids didn't even come back out of that cave. <laughs> they just stayed there. So the teacher realized that she probably was going to get fired if the parents found out what was going on. So she told the kids, go back to swimming. <laughs> okay, so this was a, um, I found this was an interesting story because I didn't know that the Welties would sometime, when I think when John Welty would get bored, they would rent the hotel to somebody else to operate. So uh, down in the, in the uh, story here, Mr. and Mrs. F.W. Nance, who have had charge of the wealthy hotel in Temecula for the past year, left Wednesday morning for San Bernardino, where they will visit for a few days. They then expect to visit friends and relatives in Los Angeles, Pomona, and Chino, after which they will visit uh, in the east, going as far as Cincinnati. Mr. and Mrs. Nance were well liked in Temecula and will be missed by their many friends. Well, that was it. They're done. That is one of my favorite pictures of the, the hotel. Well, you're going to miss the whole thing if I blow it up. How about, how about here? Look at the outfits here. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Do you want to see the hotel or the ladies? <laughs> okay, now go to the ladies. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Frawny Welty. So we have a this is a newspaper story for the press and horticulturalist, January twenty first, eighteen ninety nine. Miss Frawny Welty, who at one time the hotel was named for, her, returned to her work in the Riverside Business College last Monday morning. Her sister, Miss Tilly, went Tuesday morning. R. J. Welty is improving the appearances of the Welty Hotel with a coat of paint. He intends to paint the building inside and out. Up to this date, Temecula has received near, nearly six inches of rain, which is a rather more than any surrounding district can boast so far this year. Now you know why the river's going. There it is. That's the explanation. <laughs> The next story was from January 28, 1899. It's titled, It Blew in Temecula. Special correspondent, the terrific windstorm Monday morning spoiled the late sleeper's morning nap. It played ha havoc with the washroom at the Welty Hotel, turning it inside out and laying it flat on the street. <laughs> so, where the... Where the uh, if you came in on, on the driveway of the hotel right now, on the, uh, the side facing the, the, the creek, on the back corner was an actual little wooden attachment to the hotel where they, where they did the washing. So 
it literally a blizzard. It just blew the whole thing off and out into the street. So. <laughs> Somebody short now that I guess. Okay, this will be what. The ho hotel wealthy is without a cook this week. <laughs> this work, that useful functionary having amputated a part of her thumb while splitting kindling. Look, that's the problem. She, you know, you, you, you got to split kindling. To, you can't even have a cup of coffee until you start the fire in there, you know. So, you know, probably work it in the dark, you know, real sharp axe, you know. Tink, 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 tink. Whoop, there goes the thumb. <laughs> At least it wasn't in somebody's breakfast. So the hotel, one of the many things it was used for, was a polling place too. When you had an election, that's where you went to vote, was at the hotel. So at the time, uh, the inspector of elections was Joseph Welty. <laughs> okay, so again, this is another so this is a directory from, what year was that? Nineteen oh seven. So Tameka, you've you've got a listing of everybody who's who's here, and then we uh, end up with Hattie Welty was the postmaster and RJ Welty ran the hotel. Okay, this, this is a story that was published in a New York magazine called Forest and Stream, Saturday 7th, 1907. I'm going to start, because it's a long story, but this, it, it's, it's some guys who are going on a hunting expedition. Passenger pigeons have gone extinct. And there's a pigeon down here that very much resembled them in size and color. And so they had heard about it, and they were going to go down on this hunting expedition. So we will start, and it's been raining for days, and originally they were going to drive down to Temecula, and with all the rain, they decided to take the train. So, um, so by Saturday, it was still raining. It turned cold, and the children had taken cold and were coughing badly. So it did not take very much urging put off the trip until Monday morning. We hoped for a pleasant day, but it was still pouring on Monday morning. <laughs> However, we decided to go on, and we piled into the automobile in L.A. at 7.30, and just three hours and ten minutes later, we pulled up to the Greenwood Inn, now that, or Glenwood Inn, which is the uh, Mission, Inn. Mission Inn. That, that's what it was originally. A mutual friend with whom we had communicated by telegraph to make arrangements for a continuation of our car trip, furnishing a guide, etc., had supposed that the weather conditions were such that no sane man would stir out of doors that day. Consequently, a commission was probably convened to determine our sanity, but we were there, and we were going shooting, but we had to give up the automobile feature of it, owing to the reports of several washouts on the road between Riverside and Temecula. There was a train scheduled to leave for the south at 3.50 that afternoon, and we straight away determined that it was useless for us to try to do any shooting that day, but we could get down to the end of the road in time to make our arrangements for the next day. And that was the, and that with the hope that it would prove a pleasant day and rain and the rainstorm would be over. Charlie conducted, concluded to do some preliminary scouting by long-distance telephone, 
and he requested a good friend at Riverside to telephone to Temecula for two rooms with bath. The telephone almost went off the, off the hook at this request. And the, op as the operator was convulsed so that he did not get his breath for some minutes. But not a word was said as to whether the hotel accommodations were sumptuous with baths and hot and cold water in every room or not. But the message was ev evidently given. We were told that the rush of travel to the metropolis of Temecula was so great it might be hard work to secure a room. And later on asking the conductor which was the best hotel in town, he probably told us that it was the only one as well. <laughs> then Charlie, for a wonder, asked a question as to whether it was likely to be crowded and if we could secure accommodations. And the conductor said that undoubtedly we could secure accommodations if the home was not full. <laughs> Owing to the rain and the soft track, the train was late, and it was after seven when we pulled into the dark little station Vainly looked around for someone to transfer our trunk to the hotel, which we were told was right across the bridge. But all was as silent as a grave. Visitors evidently were not expected. The trunk was not heavy and the distance was short, so we, it was not much trouble to carry it over. And We found two very comfortable rooms at our disposal. Our baths were lacking. The town consisted of about a dozen buildings and the hotel of about as many rooms so that I understood why our Riverside friend smiled when he ordered a room with a bath. <laughs> we had sent for the livery men and also made inquiries for the gentleman with the uh, unpronounceable name to whom, whom we had the letter of introduction. He had gone home and gone to bed, but the livery men proving to our liking and seeming after all to know all about the country and the pigeon shooting, we concluded did not care, we did not care to do the social act and present our letters of introduction. We asked questions and found that some had been out shooting only a few days before and, and had probably had returned home that day. So that's this is a magazine in New York City that's published at the turn of the century about Temecula and a party going down at the hunt. I mean, you know, when when I look at uh, all these stories that we have found, I, I I'm amazed that. The hotel has so much written history in books and magazines and newspapers, so many photographs, and you hear from real people their descriptions of what's going on there. And it just, you know, you can still, when you go to the hotel, you sit in the back there and you see the hills, they're undisturbed, and, and it's it's unique. Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a real special treasure that Temecula has. I'm glad you watch TV. <laughs> <laughs> you guys like these stories? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this is the, I, sit, I took a Sanborn fire map, and I just only focused just on the hotel piece of property. You know, because when you look at those maps, everything's pretty small on them and everything. But uh, So you, you can see the hotel. You can see the water tank on the back side of the hotel. You see the little, uh, the little uh, granite building. That's the wine cellar, and then the little wealthy house behind that. And then on the on the back side of the property is the uh, shed and the barn that was used for the trials, jury trials. Because you, know. uh, you couldn't, you you're not going to have a courtroom in a town of 200 people. You know, you're going to use use what you can use. So there's the uh, to make the train station. Um, the third owner, Horace Parker, his dad ran the train station. So Horace Parker grew up in Temecula during the teens. So very familiar with it. And again, just another view of the, of the hotel, train station. And he bought the hotel. Yeah. 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 Because he yeah. found out that if you, if you died in Temecula and owned property, oh, yeah. you could be buried in Temecula. Yeah, so he, yeah, he went shopping house. <laughs> so he could be buried there. $5,000 bought it as a house, and it was closed for 65 years before we bought it. Okay, we have another story that was published in 1910. 
And I've just excerpted, because it's a long story, so I've just cut it down to just the part that deals with uh, Temecula. So, we were riding down through Rincon, crossing the San Luis Rey River, and I little dream then that 31 years later we would buy a ranch in Rincon. Pala is 11 miles beyond Rincon and the river, and as we approached it, the hills were turning pink and the sun was sinking. Indians were riding home on horseback from the day's work, carrying hoes and shovels on their shoulders. It was a beautiful, peaceful time, Pala was, and is a tiny Indian village with a beautiful old mission in its center. We quickly rode through it, crossed the Pala Creek, and started up the grade to Temecula. We came to a running stream full of mint and dismounted to rest. <coughs> Tio Juan, one of the horses, was broad and heavy-footed, and Miss Freeman, Miss Small, easy-gated Dulcie, who ended up going lame, and they had to send the horse back. We were in a quiet, empty countryside. Using a saddle blanket for a table, we played a game, game of cane field by the side of the creek. It began to grow dark, and we had to grow on. Go on. Finally, Temecula appeared before us, and the hotel seemed to be the largest building in the town. We left the horses in a stable to have a good feed and rest, and dragged our weary limbs to the hotel. Without exception, that hotel has the highest, steepest stairs I have ever encountered. Let's, let's see if this is true. Oh, okay, she tell the truth. After uh, the rises were 12 inches high or more, Miss Freeman made the first step and sat down. She said, after riding Tijuana one for 48 miles, I cannot get up those stairs. I was weary too, but I had longer legs, and I pushed her while she struggled up. The room had a wash bowl with a ring of dirt around it, and there was no water in the pitcher. Too tired to consider going down those steep stairs to complain, we decided to crawl into bed unwashed and supperless. Just then, a woman appeared to say a traveling salesman had left the room, and she hadn't had time to clean it up. She proceeded to do just that. We nonetheless went to bed without supper, we couldn't face those stairs again. <laughs> Another bright day dawned. We awoke refreshed, and after breakfast, we went for our horses, tied on the saddlebags, and started off to Elsinore. It was an easy, pleasant ride, and by afternoon, we reached the town. So, that, uh, the, the story was written by a woman who, she was a, she was a famous equestrian. And she uh, competed, I think, in the 1932 Olympics, and, and I believe she had medaled. It was... Uh, Adelaide Gillis McCormick. That's her name. Again, uh, this is another directory from 1912, Temecula. Not very many people there, is there? Again, Welty Hotel. A Hattie did it for the uh, postmaster, and then Joe Welty. Joe Welty is a farmer, and R.J. Welty ran the hotel. So, another of my favorite pictures of the hotel. I just love the the, the dresses that the, the women have. Now, you know, on all these pictures, when you look, you'll still see its delivery stable down the road. This is all before the bank was built in 1914. This, this picture was also in the hotel when we, when we got it. This, this is Main Street here. I, I'm sorry, Front Street here. It is uh, Fifth Street on the corner. And then Front and Main are going to be here. That's the bank right after it got built. That's the hotel. You see a locomotive on the tracks. You can see Pujol Street to the right. Houses there. I mean, isn't that it's it's all it covers all of Old Town that picture. Is that picture available any place? Uh I, <laughs> I I have it. I, I took 
And I had it blown up and ha have it hanging in the hotel right now. I haven't ever thought about uh, anything else with that. But it just, isn't that a, a neat picture? That's a great picture. Great picture. You, know, you just, you go all the way across. It needs to be shared. <laughs> Yeah, you know, the cost of the hotel needs to be shared, too. <laughs> Up to now, we've shouldered the burden, you know. <laughs> no, we... we <laughs> yeah, no, there's, there's, you know, we, we've tried to be very generous with uh, what we can here. We've been selling to make old pictures at uh, the antique store. Uh-huh. And, you know, not super expensive, but right. you know, sell some for you. Okay. People are very interested. Yes. I, uh, at some point, I'd really like to do a book. This is, that's the, on the right, that's the front porch of the hotel, which was taken in the 1920s, probably, okay. probably 1920. It's just based on the, on the car. It could be even 1915. We know it's after the bank because it's there, so that's, when that was, was the bank 1914. Okay. First uh, poured concrete structure in Riverside County. Okay, so this is a page from the Hotel Diary. And I copied this page because there's two studios on there. Um, we found about 20 movies filmed in the, in, in the, in the 20s in, in Temecula. And one of the movies we tracked down William S. Hart, three word brand. Now, I couldn't, I can't buy the movie, but I was able to pay to rent the movie. And so I rented it, and I got a, a screenshot. That's the front of the hotel. You know, they, they've got the cowboys go into the hotel, and they scare the women, and they do all this, you know. They do all the fun stuff, you know. So. In fact, the other thing, you know, like, Here's the interesting thing. So when, when, a, when, when a Hollywood studio was in Temecula, they came because they get all their stock footage of cowboys and cows for free. They just film it. But they'd stay in the hotel, they'd come up with these corny scripts and make the movie. But see, the, the people that were in the, uh, the actors and everything, they'd stay in the hotel. So they're, you know, everybody's, everybody's here on their, you know, they signed in on the register. So I say two two different studios are here, you know, within a week of each other. So I think that was Hart's last movie. Was it? And we come to an end because the property gets sold by the Welties to uh, Grace Leclerc. So that kind of brings it to the end. I've got a couple things that. Uh, that uh, Mary Jane had written. In February 6, 1915, Hattie resigned her position as postmistress to devote her time to caring for her father and mother. Mary Jane welcomed into this world all the new babies within a radius of many miles. Johnson Wells, well, he passed away on November 29, 1922, at the age of 84 years old. He suffered no sickness. He ate a good supper, and at midnight, he woke up his wife, said, Goodbye, Mary. I'm going. And before she could call anybody else, he passed away. <laughs> Again, he left the little woman behind, but this time there would be no returning. Mary must learn to live with that. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? <laughs> Should I even ask? <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah. I just, but I'm still amazed because you know they had those huge uh, containers, uh, the big giant dumpsters. They had, I think, like 10 or 15 of those they hauled out of there. It was a lot cleaning out. Because we went through, I met the, the guy who owns the property. He took us through the buildings. We looked around. And to find that. And that's that's why, you know, even when my parents passed away, you know, we kind of,
took our time going through the house and going through things because, you know, things are buried everywhere, little buried treasures and stuff. And, and uh, so, yeah, it's it was meant to be about. Yes? Three questions. One of them is... Um, you only get one. <laughs> um, I know that sounds kind of stupid, but are you open for business for a hotel? Right now we're not. We were. We when we restored it, we have we have multiple businesses. At the time we opened, I mean we opened it because it was gonna get bulldozed, you know, if we didn't rescue it. So we we did it and we did open it one day a week, uh, Saturday night. Uh, we originally started Friday and Saturday, but you know, you didn't get as many people on a Friday because either you're coming from LA or San Diego, and who wants to get on the freeway on a Friday afternoon and drive to Temecula? So uh, we'd open it Saturday night. It shared bathrooms. My wife would make breakfast in, uh, on Sunday morning. We would do a campfire at night. There's no TVs or modern conveniences there at all. And uh, we, within a matter of weeks, we were 9.9 .9 out of 10 on Booking.com, and we maintained that the whole time we had the hotel open because people loved it. Yeah. You know, it was the most expensive rooms in Temecula. It was an experience. It was an experience. It, they came for the history and. Uh, you know, if they went out wine tasting or beer tasting and they brought something with them, that's fine. If they didn't have anything, I'd get whiskey out. I made sure everybody was happy. <laughs> and, uh, Your so. favorite brand? <laughs> you know what? I don't know if I should admit this. We're not taped or anything, are we? <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah, I, I won't mention I probably have a hundred different bottles of whiskey in, in my bar. Maybe eight or ten open at a time. And I, and I used to teach people, you know, how to enjoy whiskey. And a lot of people don't like, you know, I just drink it straight neat. And then I go, wait a minute. I'm putting my bar in jeopardy. <laughs> as long as I don't like it, it's safe. No, who doesn't? Yeah. You, yeah. you have to answer two of my other questions. And one of them was, um, oh, yes, about whiskey? Yeah, about whiskey. Um, about whiskey? No, it was actually about the, sort of like the prices, but you sort of alluded to that it was on the high end. Well, okay, so... The rooms range from 275 to 450 plus tax. So the cheapest room was with tax, I think, like 306. The most expensive was the uh, wedding suite, which actually has its own bathroom and, and, and a little kitchen area. It was uh, with tax 500 and 500 and some dollars and or something. And it included breakfast and a bottle of wine. Yeah, and a whiskey. <laughs> well, like I say, if you showed up at the campfire and you came unprepared, you know what? Okay, I don't like anybody who nickels and dimes you on, on anything. So you pay the price. Now, I would talk to people. I'd like, find out what occasion was this or that. Maybe what kind of desserts we like. And we'd go pick stuff up and we'd surprise them. You know, we just we treated people the way we like to get treated. You know, and and so I say it was people. People loved it. That campfire, you never saw any cell phones out. People were just talking to each other across the, the fire. Uh, we ended up, since we restored it, while we were still doing it as a hotel, we ended up in Glamour Magazine UK twice, photo shoots. We allowed international photographers to shoot there. They like the hotel because it's real. They don't like fake stuff, so they want real. And the fact that... Uh, we don't charge or anything else, but you have to identify in those photos that it was taken at the Hotel Temecula in Temecula, California. I guarantee you there's no other hotels in Southern California that, it, that you know, are getting that kind of uh, review. Yeah. Okay, so the last question I yeah. wanted to say um, I think I heard this a couple years ago, maybe um, I remember right here, but that you're not allowed in, you said it sort of. Not allowed any devices in on the somebody told me. Such as well, I don't know what kind of devices. Electronic devices, they say no. you can't you can't. No, I mean, but nobody does. Oh. I mean we've had um, we had another time we had from Disney Studios, we had an animator and a guy who does the storyboards. And they're watching, you know, we had chickens on the property, you know, that's how you get the eggs in the morning for breakfast. So <clears throat> they're studying these these chickens. And you know, my wife just saying, what do they go look at the chickens? And says, she finally asked them. And he goes, well, we're animators. The, the movement of dinosaurs, I guess, is chickens move the same way. So, you know, they're sitting there doing that. We've had, we've had, um, we had a person who 
was famous on, on evening news up in LA who stayed there. They came down because when the doors, when the gate closes, you know, the hotel is not open for people just to wander around. Mm -hmm. You have to stay there. In fact, it was really odd because one time somebody comes up to the lobby and, uh, you know, normally we're booked before, you know, by, by when we get there. We, you know, with the, the booking's done online. And this person, she starts talking, and she's got this group of people with her, and she's going to show them around the hotel. And says, we well, can't do that. Well, why not? Well, because we have guests here. They paid to stay here. They might want their privacy. You're not going to be walking through the hall. I mean, it's a small hotel, you know. You, you're not just wandering around. So she was incensed. I demand to talk to the owner. I said, well, I am the owner. <laughs> what would you like to tell me? <laughs> I, I've never been this treated like this. No, I mean, it's, you know. <laughs> so, that was your last question, right? Okay. Yes. Have you upgraded from the straw mattresses yet? Yes. Um, we, we got the very best mattresses you can buy. We got really good pills. We got different kind, you know, foam and feather and anything. And made sure, because I say people, okay, when I met my wife, I would sleep with one thin sheet and I had one thin pillow. And I marry her and then all of a sudden that bed is all gussied up and you know, multiple blankets, multiple pillows. You can't even find a place to sleep with so many pillows. I think beds are very important. <laughs> so people love those beds. I mean, they're so comfortable. And uh, so you got rage. I got, I got one more story. So we, we, you go and get your chicken eggs on Sunday morning, and then they bring them in and I fry them up. There's, you know, 10, 20 people there. And so we took all the, what are those, spring mattresses? Oh, right? the, the, the old metal spring mattresses. Yeah. We've got a couple of them leaning back against the fence. We were going to put some plants in. We're we haven't do done some it yet. succulent plants. Yeah. yeah. Ha haven't done it yet. But and what so, happened, dear? So we go out to do a head count on the chickens. Before we close we've it. We've got chicken hawks and you just got to make sure if they did come home to roost. So um, I walk out and I said, Richard, grab uh, wire cutters and, your, and a camera. He goes, what? And he comes over. Well, three of the chickens had caught their necks in the... They're alive, but they're, they're, their heads are sticking out of the round part of the spring. <laughs> yeah. And so, so I, I, he says, what's the camera for? I said, well, we have spring chickens. <laughs> So I, I did take a picture of the spring chickens, and then I carefully extracted them from them. <laughs> on, on that note, we probably ought to start wrapping up here, so it's been delightful, Richard. Well, thank you for inviting me.